On behalf of GSB and the Lectures Committee, uh, welcome to this evening's presentation. My name is Dan Perkins, and I'm fortunate enough to teach most of the film courses in the telecommunicative arts area of the speech department. And because of my interest in, in film, it's a professional privilege for me to be able to introduce this evening's guest. Judith Christ is a native New Yorker, received a BA degree from Hunter College, taught at the State College of Washington, served as a civilian instructor with the Air Force, graduated from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism, with an MS degree, and then joined the New York Herald Tribune. Worked there, serving successively as a reporter, editor for the arts, associate drama critic, and film critic. She continued as a film critic on the Tribune's successor, the New York World Journal Tribune. From 1963 to 1973, was film and drama critic on NBC's Today Show. Was film critic for New York Magazine from its inception till 19, uh, in 1968 until 1975. Currently, she is film critic for New York Post and TV Guide magazines. She has won numerous awards, including such prestigious awards as the George Polk Journalism Award in 1950. In 1955 and 59, she received awards for best local reporting from the New York Newswomen's Club. In 55, a best domestic news reporting page one award from the American Newspaper Guild and numerous other awards. In 1970, Ms. Christ was one of the 12 alumni who received the Hunter College President's Medal for Distinguished Service. And in that same year, a poll conducted by Lewis Harris Associates found her to be regarded as one of the most influential film critics in the United States. She's twice been elected chairman of the New York Film Critics Circle and is also a member of the National Society of Film Critics. She is in her own words in the introduction to her book, The Private Eye, the Cowboy, and the Very Naked Girl, a critic who speaks for the movie lover rather than the cineast. For you, I guess, rather than for me. She suggests, I have subscribed to James Agee premise that film criticism is a conversation between moviegoers. I relish agreement, but I think quite frankly that my immediate goal is to keep the conversation going, to stimulate my listener into a response, whether it involves a reprisal of his own opinions or an affirmation of his disagreement. Ours is the age of the expert, where we sit and wait to get the word from on high to operate on a consensus of what the ephemeral they think. If I can prod a person or two into just thinking for himself, let alone organizing his thought into opinion form, let alone even articulating that opinion, critical mission practically accomplished. With her topic, in contrast to that on the posters, every man his own critic, I give you Judith Christ. Thank you very much. Uh, the notion that my talk title, Every Man His Own Critic, was sexist, uh, filtered into, I guess, the lecture agency's ken. And so I had spent the past week brooding on what anyone would think of a topic that said, every one one's own critic. The possibilities were limitless. But I thought, at least if we started out on a slightly sexist basis of every man his own critic, uh, we would start our dialogue. And as we all know, most dialogues are started by monologues. Uh, but I will try to keep mine briefly and really just toss out a few of the notions uh, that have been in my head about movies in recent months. I think that what has struck me with my host here, the cineast, uh, is time and again and still 
a slight wonderment uh, that I am in a campus talking about movies. Uh, even though you have relatively few cinema courses, well, recently I was in Dallas at the university there, uh, Southern Methodist, and I met a young man who told me that he was getting his doctorate in Judy Garland. <laughs> well, things have certainly changed from when I was a girl. And I hasten to assure you that there was running water, electricity, electric lights, the automobile was with us, and even, would you believe, the airplane. But movies were not respectable. Uh, you felt a little bit, if you were a class-cutting cineast, uh, if you lost half your college credits in a really good year by overcutting in order to go to the movies, uh, you were regarded very much the way people who cut class uh, to go catch the latest episode of As the World Turns uh, are regarded nowadays. Uh, it was a kind of lower class addiction uh, a little bit like television has been for too long a time. Uh, intelligent people uh, read books, went to theater, ballet, listened to good music. We even talked to each other in those days. Uh, you could be outdoors and breathe fresh air in those days. Uh, but going to the movies uh, was a little bit like uh, participating in uh, the all-American opiate of the people. And movies in those days were for many of us, and certainly for my generation, our basic link with the rest of the world. Uh, if we saw on a screen the Eiffel Tower, we knew we were in Paris. Uh, if we saw St. Peter's, Rome, of course, and that grand old house of parliament with Big Ben tolling away set us in Britain. The rest of the time it was, for the most part, America, and all the time it was the back lot of a studio. And if you look at the early films, basically, not of the 20s, let's say the early film of the sound era, it is astonishing to see how naive we must have been. As there's one in particular I saw recently uh, called The Little Minister, made in the 30s with Catherine Hepburn, marvelously fragile, and John Beale was the little minister. And Catherine Hepburn goes walking over the heath and the heather, and you keep hearing clunk, 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 as she goes through uh, all the grassy swards to be gone through. Uh, and you can see every bit of the artifice of the trees and the flowers and the hillsides and the backdrops. And you say, gee, I really must have been a child in those days. And then you see the relationships between people. I'm talking about the mass-produced movies. And you say, gee, did we really swallow that? No wonder I walked around with the illusion, even in my teens, uh, that my parents were either perverted or peculiar, uh, or poor, because they slept in a double bed. Uh, everybody in the movie slept in twin beds. <laughs> it was written, uh, just as, thank God for the corner, candy store where you learned more, but if we depended on the movies for learning the facts of life, boy, we knew that if you shook hands with a soldier who was on his way to World War I, in no time at all you were going to have a baby, and by the time the movie ended you were going to be dead. <laughs> These are the reflections of the 30s and 40s. 
And as I look back on them, I realized suddenly that these are the movies that reflected the life and the attitudes and the morals and the aspirations of these United States. And I arrived having to face the fact after all these years of devotion to movies that there had to be some reason or at least some rationalization for an adult spending all of her time going to the movies. You select the movies you want to see. I go to see all the movies that are made and given a theatrical exposure in the city of New York, which has a lot of movie houses that take a lot of product. And many is the time that I sit in the dark and say, is it for this my mother kept me warm and guarded me against the storm, let alone that I learned how to read and write? And you develop a rationalization, as you must, for doing exactly what you always hoped you'd be able to do. I am one of the few fortunates. And I suddenly realized that indeed, I would let others sing the songs of the nation, let alone write the laws. I would look at the movies and I would see the face of America. And I realized that my basic interest in film is in its reflection of our society. And it becomes a fascinating study. In fact, were I in the dissertation market, boy, is there a dissertation in this theory. And it is just a theory. My brother, the sociologist, would throw up because I can't give you data. <laughs> All I know is what I have seen in the movies. For example, and we've had some beautiful examples in recent years, last year, Gone with the Wind, was finally released on television. And what was extremely interesting was that on two successive nights, as they had the season before on home box office, some 60, 80 million Americans were sitting there watching Gone with the Wind. And whether you liked it with 122 commercials station breaks and announcements, a fascinating total when you think that it is, after all, only a three and a half hour movie. You nevertheless had an opportunity to look at this movie that was made in 1939. And while the artifacts in this movie are quite civil war and in period because nobody could beat Hollywood in its prime as far as artifacts were concerned, as far as historic authenticity of things and of settings were concerned. Because boy, could Hollywood buy history professors in them days and specialists and had the finest factories and art studios to create it. You will learn from Gone with the Wind a lot more about the way people looked and the way people behaved and the way people thought and what their morals were and what their standards and ideals were. In 1939, when the movie was made, than you will about the way anyone thought in pre and post-Civil War days 
in the deep south. You look at the women and their faces and their hairstyles are predominantly 1939 with a suggestion of the 1860s. You look at their treatment and at towards, at, at treatment of and attitudes towards blacks, towards women, uh, towards economic situation, and it is exactly the reflection of 1939. A more recent example is The Godfather, part one and part two. Godfather part one came out in the pre-Watergate days. What does Godfather part one tell you? It tells you, here is a family, a group of people. Nice people, but they happen to be criminals. Uh, they deal in union rackets, they deal in prostitution, uh, they deal in narcotics, a little reluctantly, but they deal in narcotics. Uh, they occasionally kill people. But what the hell, you know, your friendly neighborhood politician uh, is corrupt, your cops are corrupt, and, you know, and one thing about this family, you can say that they're criminals and everything else, but boy, have they got a sense of family feeling. <laughs> and not many of us have that. That is exactly what Godfather, the Godfather, told you. In beautiful movie terms, I mean, you just sat glued there, even as I, and we wanted more, more, more. Uh, but if you looked at yourself in the mirror after The Godfather, uh, the message that you'd been fed was not a very attractive one. It was essentially that, what the hell, everybody's a crook nowadays, and these are superior crooks because their family hasn't fallen to pieces the way yours probably has. Godfather Part Two comes out after Watergate, right? Four years later. It is written by the same people, performed in large part by the same people. But what does The Godfather Part Two tell you? It tells you these people are crooks and they have infiltrated every part of your life on a national and virtually international scale. And they are not nice people. They beat up their wives. They kill their brothers. They are not nice people. And these two films specifically reflect our national morality, where in 19, the 1970s, it was that period of, well, everybody's doing it, and it's all right to be a crook. It all depends from whom you steal, right? Uh, it's OK if it's the phone company or the mafia. It doesn't really matter. Uh, everybody is doing it. Uh, and that was a great deal of the national feeling in the early 70s. After a national trauma that came in 73, 74, by 75, we were saying it is not nice to be a thief because we had begun to discover that while there were thieves among us, that was not in essence, our morality. And in this way, film basically reflects the temper of the times because films are made by contemporary people. And while it takes a year or two or three for the film to go from, hey, Charlie, how about a movie about until the movie lands in your neighborhood house. Nevertheless, the mirror of contemporary feeling is there. And I think that that is the major purpose at this time in studying films, 
because we can see our past. We see our ideal. We see our morality. Marvelous example. If any of you ever saw an Andy Hardy movie, it might linger in your memory, if not your parents' memories. But this was a series of films that really reflected adolescent America. And there was Andy Hardy, who came equipped the way any good American boy should, with an older sister who kind of bugged him. Devoted parents. And in this nuclear family, there was an aunt, a spinster aunt who lived with them, and at one point, even a grandmother. Andy Hardy was the hero. He went to high school, and he was a real all-American kid. And he had a steady girlfriend who lived next door. And Andy always got into some kind of trouble. And it was very happily resolved by his father, Judge Hardy, who would have a father-to-son, man-to-man talk with Andy and straighten out all his problems. And Andy and we would get a little lecture, and then Andy would go on for further activities in his happy adolescence. I remember one, which was among the most successful, called Love Comes to Andy Hardy. And Andy Hardy, Mickey Rooney, had turned from his steady girlfriend, Anne Rutherford, who whose name, of course, was Polly, who lived down the block, and had become interested in a new girl in town. And she wore bobby socks and Mary Janes, and she sang, and indeed it was Judy Garland. And in one rather rash and exciting scene, Andy Hardy kissed Judy Garland on the cheek. And that was being pretty racy, because after all, we knew his heart belonged to Polly, who lived down the street. Recently, I saw a film for television that was called James at 15. And it was about a boy called James, who was in high school in a small town in Oregon. And he, uh, Oh, indulged in a lot of things. He was sort of interested in photography, and uh, uh, he didn't have his own car yet, but that was sort of just around the corner, and he was going to become a junior and so on. And he has a blonde girlfriend, a girl who had snubbed him for a while, but he becomes kind of famous taking photographs of the local football hero. And so he has his Polly. This is 1977, and the film is made for television, which has taken over since 1938, the Andy Hardy era, the kind of Andy Hardy movies and other movies that used to bring America to the movie house three times a week for double features. James at 15 borrows a contraceptive from his friend, borrows a contraceptive, <laughs> and sets off for a day in the mountains with his beloved blonde girlfriend, uh, his high school classmate. And they are going to consummate their affection in a sleeping bag. But it turns out that it's frightfully cold and neither of them seems to function properly. And so they come on down the hill again and say, well, wait until warm weather comes. <laughs> uh, the tragedy is, of course, that uh, just to fill you in on the rest of this, that the upheaval, the dramatic crisis is that James's father is a college professor and he has gotten an appointment at a college in Boston. And the whole family is going to move from bucolic, sort of semi-rural or suburban Oregon to wicked urban Boston. And James can't stand it. He will never get to be in that sleeping bag in warm weather. 
so he leaves home. And he is on his way home when he decide, back to Oregon, hitchhiking, when he decides to call the blonde. He discovers that she has by now lost her heart to the football player. Uh, and so James decides not to go back to Oregon, but to go off to Canada uh, and live uh, a, a life there as a farmer. Uh, but as he is uh, trudging along the road, he meets a fellow hitchhiker. And it's one of Charlie's angels, would you believe? Uh, it's Kate Jackson. She's the pretty brunette one who is still one of Charlie's angels. <laughs> and it is she who gives James that father-to-son, man-to-man talk <laughs> that convinces James that he should go back to Boston and finish school and love his parents and live happily ever after. And when I saw James at 15, I thought Andy Hardy had never had it quite so good. <laughs> but nevertheless, here was an exact transposition in 40 years of what had happened to our amusing small town high school boy. And indeed, you got an exact mirror of where our treatment of adolescence had gone in these years. And just as we had thought Andy Hardy was a pretty daring kid, compared to the Hardy Boys of an earlier generation. Here we see the continuing progress and the evolution of American morality. I mean, I'm sort of glad that my parents aren't around to see a discussion of contraceptives on television during the family hour. I mean, we found it pretty traumatic on PBS uh, later in the evening in the life story of Margaret Sanger. Uh, but during the family hour, I tell you, James at 15 was pretty heady stuff. <laughs> Nevertheless, it still wasn't soap, was it? It still wasn't Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman in her latter days. And here is again the mirror image of where our standards are going. Film, to me, records this. If I were teaching history, American history, I would show Westward the Women, one of my favorite movies, a really rotten one, made in 1951. I would show it, however, as part of the history of 1951. This is a story of a wagon train filled with mail order brides going from Chicago to California in 1890 or so. But what you've got is a wagon train load full of 1951 women who, when they arrive at the camp, are going to be treated the way 1951 expected mail order brides to be treated and not the way 1890 mail order brides were treated. And in every film that dares a period setting, you are going to get this beautiful period setting and a reflection of the exact period in which the movie was made. We've just gotten out of a whole era of westerns where all the frontier women are wearing long flowing hair. You know, the kind that would get stuck in wagon spokes, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, would be caught by the corn as they walked through their fields, uh, that an Indian 30 yards away could grab for scalping, but it all flows 
because the 1960s-70s ideal of pretty women was with the hair that hung down flat. And so you got it, no matter what you were watching uh, on television set in whatever period, and in the movies. And very basically, if we watched a Civil War drama with authentic Civil War hairdos, we would say, God, what funny looking people, uh, and not relate to them. And so there is the theatrical privilege taken, true, of helping us to relate to times past. Uh, you know, uh, Claudette Colbert with those exquisite tweezed eyebrows, uh, all the great nun stories that you've seen, except the nun story, uh, where all the nuns have just the right amount of lipstick on them and just the right number of false eyelashes uh, so that we can really relate to them and know that they're real people uh, because they would look very funny without contemporary makeup for us to associate with. But beyond all these theatrical privileges, what you are really getting is the author. In the case of film, you are getting the authors, the team, the corporate group that has made the movie. This, to me, is the interesting thing about film. Because while we have come to think of it as an art form, now that it has become respectable, not quite the lowbrow entertainment it used to be, film has suddenly taken that gigantic leap into being an art form and a subject of study. Suddenly, film, in my view, is being taken much too seriously. We have forgotten that 90% of manufactured film is designed as entertainment. And if you want to be critical about it with any kind of elitist standard of taste, we're dealing with a medium, 75% of whose product is trash. <laughs>